Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, and thank you for coming along today and for your patience. Uh, so sometime this evening when the world ends, I'll be over the Atlantic and I will arrive either to a brave new world tomorrow in New York or to um, a few somber faces. Uh, and so thank you for changing the date. Um, so uh, this is a very famous picture of the Chinese basketball legend Yao Ming pert and upright while people around him are slumbering. So I hope that I will not uh, induce on you the same suffering that I believe Hu Jintao was doing on his audience at the time. It's a pretty impressive uh, group of slumbering officials around him. Uh, but I've always been very, very, and as some people in the audience will also have experienced, the amazing ability of Chinese auditors to listen while their eyes closed. Um, the powers of Xi Jinping is what I'm talking about. How long do I want to talk today? 20 minutes or? 20? 30 minutes, okay, right. Um, so the powers of Xi Jinping is a very popular subject at the moment, and it's only likely to get more popular in the next year because there will be a party congress next year, and we get all terribly excited by these five yearly events. And there will be, no doubt, enormous speculation about who will be Xi Jinping's successor or whether he will actually have any visible successor. And I'll say a little bit about that later. But as you can see from this cover from The Economist a few years ago, she has been associated with almost imperial kinds of power. This is him as the Qianlong Emperor from the, 19th, the 18th century, uh, during a period of high kind of Qing splendor. Uh, but it's the sort of image that I believe people in China also have of Xi being this all-powerful figure, and indeed no less a person than President Obama a couple of years ago, most unusually really for a foreign leader, said of Xi that he had more powers than any recent leader of China. He didn't actually compare him to Mao Zedong, but certainly people since then have said that Xi Jinping is almost like a Mao figure. I think we should pause on that and remember, and some of you here will remember the period of Mao Zedong, if you compare the trajectory of the career of Xi Jinping to Mao Zedong, it is somewhat dissimilar. Uh, Mao Zedong joined the Communist Party in the late 1910s. He was an attendee, one of only 13 attendees at the first Congress in 1921 in Shanghai and then in Zhejiang province. He went through the most terrible periods of the parties coming to power when it was a fugitive force, a guerrilla force. He was present when the party was nearly decimated by the nationalists in 1927. He fought in some of the great struggles during the 1930s, the Long March, these legendary events. He also fought fiercely against Soviet-inspired individuals for the soul of the party and engaged with the nationalists from 1937 in the struggle in the uh, Sino-Japanese War. In 1945, after that, 1946, when that war was won, he then led the nationalists in their epic, sorry, the communists in their epic battle against the nationalists and brought the Communist Party to power in 1949. And from 1949 to 1976, with a few hiccups, he was the dominant preeminent leader. Well, this is an extraordinary career. It has left a shadow on Chinese politics and history to today. And to compare it to someone who has, with the greatest respect, had a fairly orthodox provincial career with no amazing achievements, I mean good achievements, but pretty standard in a way, as Xi Jinping has, 16 years in Fujian, a few years in Zhejiang province, seven months in Shanghai, and then central leadership positions, largely an administrative kind of bureaucratic career. To compare the Mao period and Xi Jinping's period seems like comparing two completely different sorts of powers. And I think that's where the confusion comes from. Our narratives of Chinese power are somewhat circumscribed by the histories, of course, but also by the fact that this Maoist template of history is very powerful. It's something that has really captured the imaginations of people and is something that we are unwilling to lose hold of. Mao Zedong, in a sense, is still, uh, you know, the, the, the Mao Zedong of contemporary China is Mao Zedong. It's not Xi Jinping. And to say that Xi Jinping is a Maoist leader is a highly contentious statement. It's not something that is very easy to say within the context of Chinese politics, within Chinese political discourse in China, as I learnt last week in Shanghai. Last week in Shanghai, I gave a talk at the Foreign Correspondents Club, and I was talking about the use of Xi Jinping as the core leader in Chinese, as He Xinlingdao. Xi Jinping as the core leader is something that has just been issued in the plenum, one of these annual meetings of the party central committee, 
And it was a striking comment because it hadn't really been used uh, in the previous de decade with Hu Jintao. And that was always seen as a you know, kind of interesting issue that Hu Jintao didn't really have this legitimacy of this core leadership um, sort of moniker. Core leader itself, this term, actually appeared at the end of the 1980s and was used by Deng Xiaoping about the Jiang Zemin leadership to confer some kind of legitimacy upon it. Of course, in 1989, after Tiananmen Square, a period of great confusion, Jiang Zemin was brought up as the party secretary from Shanghai to Beijing and made the national leader, national party leader, and needed as much legitimacy as he could get. In a sense, historically, therefore, core leader, as it's called, is almost a kind of sign of weakness rather than strength. Why would you need this sort of term to be used about you? The core leader was used about Jiang Zemin throughout the 1990s, and because it wasn't used about Hu Jintao, its reappearance now in 2016 was said to be a striking show of the emergence of a kind of Xi Jinping who was autocratic, all-powerful, and greedy for more titles. My former colleague in Australia, Jerry Barmay at the ANU in Canberra, called Xi Jinping the uh, chairman of everything. There seems to be, of these 16 leading small groups where policy making is made between government and the party, Xi Jinping sits on six or seven of them. He is the party secretary of the Communist Party. He's the president since 2013. He's the chair of the Central Military Commission. He seems to be on every single kind of board. And this is seen as indicative of his hunger for power positions. But what does it mean? The question really is, with all of these titles, what can he actually do? You may have read The Economist last week with this very telling phrase about how Xi Jinping is the chairman of everything, and yet there's very little that he can do. There's a simple reason for that. The China of Mao Zedong, opened up until 1976, was a far simpler economy and a political economy and a diplomatic act than the one today. In 1966, China only had one ambassador abroad, abroad Huang Hua, in Egypt. In, 1970, uh, in 1966, beginning of the Cultural Revolution, China's economy was relatively small and relatively undeveloped. It didn't have anything like the global scope it has now. It was a little understood and a little known country which had been enclosed since the early 1950s. And in terms of its leadership structures, in terms of the Communist Party itself, while it had its own complexities at the time, you could not compare it to the entity that exists now. The People's Republic today is a completely different kind of animal to the uh, country that existed then. And in fact, once more, we're comparing things which are in many ways incomparable. Mao Zedong really could be autocratic. He really could take on the Communist Party of China, which he did during the uh, Cultural Revolution, literally took on the creation that he himself had made in order to tailor it to his own desires. But I don't think that Xi Jinping could, and I'll say a little bit more about Xi Jinping and the party a little later. Who is Xi Jinping? Where does he come from? Uh, where you know, is his actual uh, you know, kind of autobiography tell us about him? Well, the interesting thing that I've thought about over the years about, uh, these are just some images that I'm going to put up while I'm talking to divert you, um, and so you don't fall asleep like the people around Yao Ming. Um, one of the interesting things um, about Chinese politics that I've sort of been reflecting on lately is we do think it is very opaque, we think it's very complicated, and you know, there's this sort of whole sort of, uh, I guess, you know, industry really of speculation about this very opaque thing called the Communist Party and the sort of leadership right at the top and all sorts of mystique about it. Uh, but really, is it that complicated? I mean, if we think of the complexity that we see in American or European or even British politics at the moment and the incredible differences between people's backgrounds, between the things that motivate people to go into politics, the most extraordinary thing when you look at the Chinese political elite at the moment is how homogenous they are. They are all, well, of the Communist Party of China, if we, we talk, let's talk about the sort of absolute elite, the Central Committee, 350 high-level communist officials. Um, so that 350, 20% are women, <coughs> probably a similar proportion are ethnic minority, maybe even less, maybe 10% are ethnic minority. Uh, their age is basically from the age of 45 upwards. Most of them, the overwhelming majority of them, from 55 upwards. Most of them have had university education, and the overwhelming majority, as I've just said, are Han Chinese. 
that's an incredibly kind of undiverse background. If we look at the Standing Committee of the Politburo today, for instance, which Xi Jinping sits on, seven people, all Han Chinese, all over 60, all basically from provincial leadership backgrounds, apart from one, Liu Yunshan, the propaganda czar, and all dyeing their hair. So this is an extraordinary kind of narrow group, not a very wide group, and it isn't exactly representative of the diversity of Chinese society. And in an odd way, Xi Jinping is very indicative of this kind of group. He is Han Chinese. He is 64, I think, at the moment. He went to Tsinghua University, the elite university in Beijing in the mid-1970s. He did most of his career before 2007 in provincial leadership positions. He has been a member of the Communist Party of China since 1973. He tried to join 10 times. There are a couple of things that are interesting about his background. The first is, of course, that we say that he is a member of the elite, the high-level official children, Gao Gans in Chinese. But actually, he's a member of a kind of sub-elite. It's not one of the major families, the eight immortal families. It's a kind of family network which is relatively subliminal. It's not a very, very powerful family. His father, Xi Jongshun, was in the Ministry of Culture until 1962, 1963, and then was felled because of involvement in a novel which was regarded as being critical of the Maoist leadership. He then spent about 19 years under house arrest. So this was a little bit different because Xi Jongshun disappeared before the Cultural Revolution started. He wasn't a victim of the Cultural Revolution. So in many ways, while we talk about Xi Jinping being from an elitist background, he is from one part of the elite which is nowhere near as powerful and influential as other parts of the elite. And that elite level background actually extends to many thousands of people. Does it really give us a great explanatory power to say that he's from this kind of background? I don't think it really does. It belongs to this really weird language of factionism where we think that just because we know the externalities of someone's career and the externalities of someone's allegiance uh, and family and everything, this tells us about their political soul. We wouldn't expect that, we wouldn't accept that kind of uh, explanation in most political cultures. We certainly wouldn't think it tells us a huge amount that's meaningful about someone in British politics that they went, for instance, to Cambridge or Oxford or somewhere like that. It tells you a little bit, but not a huge amount. And yet in Chinese politics, we privilege these externalities because we feel that we can't know what the internal kinds of ambitions and ideas of elite political figures are. And that, I guess, brings us to the second issue. This is Xi Jongshun and Xi Jinping uh, when he was a young man. Um, this brings us to the second issue of um, what do Chinese, you know, what do Chinese leaders believe then? I mean, what's, what is it that's in their soul? This is uh, the head of the propaganda uh, entities, Liu Yunshan, a man who spent a number of years in Inner Mongolia, where, uh, as you heard earlier, I spent a couple of years in the mid 1990s, an ex-journalist actually for Xinhua University, uh, Xinhua. Um, uh, press agency. He was the livestock and grain reporter in the early 1980s. You couldn't get sexier than that, could you? It shows that everyone can have a future if you can emerge from that to be a member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. Um, he did a seminar in Denmark in 2014 that I took part in, about 12 uh, experts, um, in inverted commas, uh, from across the world were summoned to Denmark while he was there to talk about what is the Communist Party of China. Uh, and we were regarded as people who should know what the Communist Party of China was. And he said to us, what do you think the party is? One of our member, uh, one member of our group said, the Communist Party of China is um, fragmented authoritarian. And he looked at us like, <laughs> he said, well, we're not fragmented and we're not authoritarian, so try again. <laughs> so we got a little bit confused and we wandered around and then we ended up with consultative Leninist and he just gave up on us. And so he then got an enormous, so our reward, what was our reward? Uh, a long speech. So we got a 40 minute speech on what was the Communist Party of China. It was the repository of the hopes and aspirations of all Chinese people. It was a epistemic community that had learned from 1949 the mysteries and magic of governance in China and that was taking China towards its dream of modernity. Could you imagine an official from the Conservative or Labour Party giving you such an answer in Europe, uh, in Britain? No, it's an extraordinary vision of what a political party is in China, what the Communist Party is, which I'll come to in a second. 
But certainly, the idea that ideology doesn't matter in China, that's the belief, of course, that it is now a vehemently capitalist society where the party has this almost hypocritical role, I think is erroneous. The reason why I think it's erroneous is because were ideology not to matter, why are there 2,000 party schools across the country? Why is it the party level, party officials at every level are expected to take part in ideological training? Why do the party elites still use this very extraordinary language uh, in which things are co uh, kind of uh, couched in, in, in uh, Marxist-Leninist discourse? Well, why? I mean, this seems a very, very strange thing because it's obviously something that alienates a lot of Chinese people. They don't really listen to these speeches with a great deal of warmth. Well, I think ideology matters because of its functionality. It is a common language amongst a group of people who, were you to get rid of this common discourse, would have very little in common. The Communist Party of China, for all its similarity, as I said earlier, in homogeneity, is also, in terms of ideological positioning, in terms of the people's positioning on, for instance, the role of the market, or the role of enterprise and the role of foreign capital, there are very, very significant differences. And therefore, the ideological language with its sameness and similarity, the language that Xi Jinping speaks fluently when he has to, is a very, very important common point amongst a group of people that without it would not really be able to function and talk together at all. It is not dissimilar in many ways to the way that medieval Latin operated in the, uh, in the church six or seven hundred years ago. Uh, of course, most people had no clue what medieval Latin meant. Most people spoke their own languages. But for the priesthood, for the elite priesthood, of course, it was a common lingua franca. It was something that they all could speak to each other. Ideology in China, Marxism and Leninism today, I think, offers that across what is, after all, a continental-sized and extremely complicated polity. Um, we know what happens when that common language breaks down. We know what happens when there is extraordinary clashes of belief systems in China. This is from the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I think in uh, Heilongjiang, uh, you know, this is the kind of period in modern Chinese history that elites like Xi Jinping remember very well today. They really cut their political teeth during this period and they learnt about how to do politics and how idealistic politics could go badly wrong. There is no uh, mystery why this year, uh, 2016, the 50th anniversary of the Cultural Revolution was only marked by one article in the People's Daily condemning it as a great mistake. The Cultural Revolution, I think, lies heavy on the thinking and minds of the Chinese people. And so ideology, while it's important, and while people know the dangers of straying beyond the parameters of uh, permitted ideology, uh, while it is important for a functional reason for the elite, does have one significant problem. It does not really speak emotionally or in terms of idealism to the people, the people that Xi Jinping, after all, referred to so heavily when he emerged at the National People's Congress, or sorry, the National Congress, the Party Congress, in 2012 on November the 15th and became the party secretary four years ago. At that time, he talked about the need for the party to reconnect to the people. We, um, we have to remember... Uh, that um, you know, Xi Jinping occupies his position of power within a very specific context. And there's a very obvious thing about that context that I want to really dwell on for the sort of final few minutes. And that is, what is the thing that he has to do? What is the sort of position he has? What's the work he has to do? Well, it's within the context of the Communist Party of China, and his powers make no sense outside of the context in which the Communist Party of China gave him. If Xi Jinping has power, those powers are granted to him through his role in the party. It might be a kind of, um, sort of have a, a relationship with a synergy. It might well be that he has autocratic tendencies, but he doesn't really have any uh, valid power base beyond the party. The party is the thing that he has to serve and that he has to occupy a position in. There is one distinctive thing about his political career through the last 40 years uh, and something that is very striking in the way that he's talked about the party. He's been pretty consistent about this. In the early 1990s, in 1991 in fact, while he was interviewed as a relatively low-ranking official in Fujian province, he made a comment to Xinhua News Agency about how the party and service to the party was important. It was slightly nostalgic and old-fashioned language. And he said that people should not go into uh, politics in order to make money. 
anyone who of course has been in China in the last 25 years will find that a startling thought. The very idea of going into the party and sitting through all those interminable boring meetings without thinking of the enormous amounts of money that you can cream off at the end of it through state enterprises and other scams is incredibly uh, counter sort of intuitive. The party is money, isn't it? And indeed, after China entered the World Trade Organization in 2001, China became this amazing powerhouse, this amazing money factory. The party was able to be like Midas, whatever it kind of touched turned to gold. Whatever sectors it got involved with, it created multi-billion dollar entities. If you wanted to create an infrastructure system, the railway system, as we found out only a few years ago, it poured enormous amounts of money in, and enormous amounts of money came back. But almost, uh, almost immediately, enormous amounts of money disappeared from within China and from the account books of state enterprises into the pockets of private individuals and abroad. This moral dilemma for the party, a party which has never really had a kind of proper ethical system, and that's common to Marxist parties everywhere, uh, was pretty profound. In 2001 onwards, China went through what one writer, Chen Konggang, called the fat years. And it was always easy during that period, as we well remember, to pay people off. The party could basically get people's loyalty with 10% GDP growth a year, and people were always loyal when the good days were more and more li likely in the future to bring them money. But in 2012, there was an awareness that this was unsustainable, not just economically, it wasn't just about the economics, and it wasn't particularly about the politics, it was about the ethical unsustainability of a system where the party was the problem, not the solution. There was also a lot of soul-searching about the behaviour of party officials at this time. We remember the absolute riot around Bo Xilai uh, and his wife being involved in the murder of the British businessman Neil Haywood, but also uh, Lin Jihua, one of the key aides to Hu Jintao, and his son dying in a Ferrari in a road crash on the 5th or 6th Ring Road in Beijing with two semi-naked Tibetans in the car. This was an extraordinary period of complete moral larceny and party officials getting absolutely out of control. And it was not just, uh, you know, kind of an attack on the legitimacy of the party, but was also regarded as being an attack on the ability of the party and the state to take China towards its final goal, which was to achieve modernity within the next decade or so. It is not surprising, therefore, that at that time, this is my interpretation, it might be a little bit unorthodox, that the party was in search of a true believer. It may well be that there is only one person in China who fundamentally and profoundly believes in Marxism, Leninism and the party's role in it, and that is Xi Jinping. But he's the only person in China who has to believe this. And the fact that he believes it gives others around him a kind of borrowed legitimacy. It's a bit like people in the Anglican Church when you quiz them about, you know, uh, incarnation or who Jesus Christ was. They phase over and look a little bit confused, but they know that the priest knows the answers. Uh, well, that may be fond faith for them, but I mean, at least they think the priest knows the answers. Um, thinking doesn't have to be knowing. I mean, that's, I guess, the point. So uh, with Xi Jinping, I think it is that he does have to believe it's, it's not negotiable. He has to be the defender of this faith and the fact that he believes it is a reassurance to everyone else. I think that's pretty true in most semi-religious or religious structures. And the party has this kind of ghostly religious function in China. It almost has a kind of, uh, you know, a theodicy and a, a, a sort of, a, a kind of, you know, spiritual function. The fact that Xi Jinping is a believer, maybe the last true believer in China, means that there is a necessity about him being in the position that he is in, that he is able to guide China towards the vision, the thing that people are all going for, and the fact that the party is behind him in that with the anti-corruption struggle and its incredible internal purges, not just politically but morally, over the last three or four years. So, with that ideology, with that party structure, with that background, what's it all about? What are they trying to get towards? Well, I suppose the final thing I'd say is that there is, in this kind of polity, a sort of vision. Um, it's different to the visions that I think we have in our politics, where status quo is probably okay if we preserve the things that we have today into the future, we make things sustainable. It's not a terrible message to give people, that we will be able to improve things slightly, that's okay, but we know that tomorrow and today, as long as they are roughly the same, will be all right. 
The role of idealism in Chinese politics means that tomorrow has to be radically better to today, and to tell people that things are kind of carry on the way they are is a very unexciting, unpalatable, and maybe uh, inducing revolution message. Xi Jinping, therefore, is the holder of this vision of what China's overall strategic goals are because of the function of the party as this almost like a kind of major think tank in charge of part, you know, national and social political development and political, you know, the trajectory towards the future. And so the vision has been spelled out pretty clearly now. That is the achievement of Chinese-style modernity in two stages. The first, the achievement of the centennial goal in 2021-2022, when China achieves moderate prosperity. And I think that's a per capita GDP, and you can put a figure on it, a per capita GDP of um, uh, US dollars 13,000, which is about the level of Shanghai at the moment. If you want to see China in the future, you go to Shanghai, that's the future. Uh, and then the second goal is what has been called the achievement of democracy with Chinese characteristics by 2049. Those goals were set by Deng Xiaoping. The future has always been a great mobiliser in Chinese politics. The future was always a vision that people had before them, despite the terrible sufferings of the present day. In Mao Zedong's period, the future was many, many decades, maybe centuries into the future, centuries hence, when the good times were going to happen. Under Deng Xiaoping, it only became a matter of decades. But now, with Xi Jinping, the future is only a few years, like a few years away. And it's an interesting question to really wonder about whether the Xi Jinping attack or Xi Jinping approach to politics is going to really satisfy people. The fact that the future is about to happen, that people are going to have this great moment of modernity in 2021. The delivery of that vision, of course, is uh, of a strong, rich country. And that has been something that has played well in Chinese politics even since the end of the Qing dynasty. China's feeling that it wasn't really a winner in the progress of modernity, that it was a victim, that it was bullied by powers like Britain uh, since the Opium War in 1839 onwards. And this moment, 2021, therefore, has a huge spiritual significance, not just political and not just economic. It is the moment when China finally becomes, after so much suffering, a victor. But quite how that moment will feel, of course, it's hard to know. And quite whether the Chinese people will, at that time, buy into the party's overall vision of its absolutely necessary role in social development is also hard to predict. After all, the party has always regarded itself as the, van as the vanguard of Chinese modernity, and its role has always been to kind of be, you know, this in the Cultural Revolution, this utop utopian creating entity, and now this entity that sort of gives great abstract strategic goals to society. So Xi Jinping, I suppose, in a sort of sentence, what is his vision um, of society? What is, you know, the thing that he needs to deliver? Well, I think it's to make one party rule sustainable. I mean, that's it in a sentence. And that is an extraordinary thing to do because were he to achieve that uh, at the head of the party that he leads, it would really buck the trend of a lot of modern history. No communist party has maintained this position over 74 years. That was the USSR when it collapsed in 1991. So in 2022, 2023, the Communist Party of China will uh, you know, be a record breaker. Um, at that time, uh, I guess China will you know, kind of enter into an extraordinary new era in which you can contemplate things like political developments with Chinese characteristics. And we will see a kind of innovative, you know, maybe an innovative te template that we don't see now. When I look at Chinese um, politics, um, just finally, there's Xi Jinping amongst the people having his... I love the woman in the background looking completely oblivious with her phone. I don't know what she's doing. She seems to sort of be attacking her phone. Maybe it's a Samsung about to blow up or something. Um, so um, this, uh, this is a, a very powerful image, actually, uh, from China recently of a young child who donated, had a, a terminal illness and donated his bone marrow uh, to another uh, a patient. And, and this, the, the sort of um, doctors, the surgeons, bowing to the dead body after doing the operation. Incredibly powerful. Uh, I, I guess sort of this moves me because it's, um, it, it shows the sort of commonalities of feeling and spirit uh, despite different cultural differences. Um, it is always good to end on a quote, um, and I've been reading a lot lately uh, Han Fei from the Warring States period, the great legalist philosopher, and he made, <laughs> this is something I think that would weigh heavy 
on Xi Jinping as he sits and looks around the room at the people um, beside him. Uh, Han Fei wrote 2,400 years ago uh, that while you should always be guarding day by day against your enemies and preparing to deal with them, at the end of the day, calamity always comes to you from those you love. Thank you. <laughs>
I don't see it being like the army in the Soviet Union, becoming this counter-party force. But the Chinese really learned from that experience to keep um, very close political tabs on the military. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, yes please. Can I ask you, you, you mentioned um, that in 2049, we theoretically get democracy with Chinese characteristics. And of course, we have a Hong Kong handover coincident with that. And Mm, yeah. Well, one of the interesting things, of course, the 50-year mark is ever closer, and so some of the new, newly elected legislators who are not able to take their position up in the Legislative Council uh, will not be that old when the 50-year 2047 happens. And I think um, when I was in Hong Kong a couple of months ago, it's surprising how this 2047 date is very, very close now. Um, so, so it is a very, very big part of what people are thinking. Uh, Xi Jinping has taken a, or his leadership have taken this very strong view on Hong Kong, um, and uh, it's a bit surprising. You, you know, they, there was an expectation that it wouldn't be so assertive, but they've uh, certainly inter, inter, uh, interfered in ways that wouldn't have been very palatable even five or ten years ago. Si uh, Lung has proved himself a spectacularly weak and incompetent local uh, leader, and I suppose there's no confidence really that he's going to represent Hong Kong's interests in, in, in Beijing. Um, I don't know whether he will stand next year, but it's, it's likely, and it's likely that this kind of incredible, you know, sort of, uh, um, sort of freeze on, China, on Hong Kong politics is going to continue. It, it's getting more and more fractious. Um, so I, I don't know whether 2047 is going to really be an issue. I just wonder whether 2027 is going to be an issue or 2017 is going to be an issue. I mean, it seems at the moment that the um, Beijing government's views on Hong Kong and the views of a considerable constituency in Hong Kong itself are very, very um, antagonistic and there's not a kind of institutional structure in which to sort these things out. I'm not a Hong Kong specialist. Uh, there are people in this audience who know way more than me, so I, I'm afraid I'll just have to sort of bid a uh, mind uncontaminated by knowledge on this one. Sorry, I, perhaps I phrased the question poorly. Oh. I was trying to ask really what you feel <laughs> Xi Jinping's strategy and plan may be to move towards, in the mainland, democracy with Chinese characteristics by 2049, mm. yeah. in the context that we have yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, um, um, I don't think there's any... Uh, that would figure in his... I mean, if he thinks about it, I don't think that will figure at all. What, what we know is that every single statement made since 20, uh, 2012 uh, is that multi-party democracy is not a runner in China. I mean, there's, there's six, six no's, and then this sort of uh, article number nine from a couple of years ago to academics saying don't talk about universe, Western universalism. And part of that is because they've seen the highly unpredictable outcomes of elections <laughs> in Europe and America. Uh, and so they're intellectually unconvinced. Um, and so there is no evidence at the moment. I, I guess if a crisis happens where it might be that some relaxation of political space is possible, these leaders are probably very pragmatic. But there's nothing at the moment to say that they have a nice game plan towards some kind of multi-party system. When they say democracy with Chinese characteristics in 2049, all they've said so far is that that will be within a one-party rubric. But I would like to elaborate on that. What does democracy with Chinese characteristics mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it means a um, one-party system which privileges preserving stability 
but which is able to have the internal structures that, avail, that, that, that allow a debate between different spectrums on, for instance, the market or the role of state enterprises. Uh, fundamentally, it means that the party is able to maintain its privileged political role in society, but you get a kind of united front as existed from the uh, 1940s onwards, in which different forces in society are able to contribute to the overall direction of Chinese economy. Wow, I should have been a Chinese official in my last life. <laughs> I really do. All I've got to do is dye my, what's left of my hair, I'll dye, and then I'll, uh, you know, kind of be, be the Hu Jintao of the 21st century. I'm very confident. Yes, please, go back. I, I just wondered if you had a, a reading on the apparent dismissal of the Minister of Finance, mm. uh, an individual who was uh, internationally respected mm. and reformed by the but presumably in the movies uh, very much uh, with the support or encouragement or even the initiation of Xi Jinping. Yes, I mean, Lo Ji Wei was uh, uh, regarded as a market reform supporter. I mean, there's going to be a lot of changes over the next year, so he was 66, I think, um, close enough to this unwritten retirement age sort of law um, or, or, or regulation. I, I don't, I mean, people will make a lot about all of these changes, but they're kind of expected before and after a Congress. I mean, there are lots and lots of positions that will be filled, and it might just be a bureaucratic thing. Um, on the whole, from what we know of the people around Xi Jinping, uh, people like Liu He and um, Jiang Xiaochuan of the People's Bank of China, these kind of individuals, they are broadly supportive of more marketization. If we see uh, steps to restrict marketization, uh, then I guess we'll know that more conservative people are becoming influential. And then we have to ask why are they, why are they becoming more influential? What is it that's made the Chinese leadership more um, conservative on this issue than they were, say, a couple of years ago. The, the thing is, in 2013, the plenum that year had this ambiguous language about marketization. On the one hand, it said, as part of its sort of 60 points, that the market was necessary for reform. And on the other hand, the second page, it said, the role of the party state within reform was absolutely unnegotiable. So that kind of <laughs> is very contradictory position. And it's meant that since then, there's always been this tension between people like Li Keqiang uh, or Jiang Xiaochuan uh, and others who really do believe that there should be more openness to state enterprises and those who are very fearful because they believe once you have more marketization, you release more uh, to you know, other actors within the economy, then you lose control. I mean, it's like Machiavelli said, you know, to trust is good, but to control is better. So at the moment, obviously, control is very important. Uh, it may be that in 2017, once most of the leadership changes are over, we'll see another spurt of liberalism. But that, they do have to deliver on these promises they made. No government in Chinese history has made so many promises. And so I can't see, politically, in any system, you have to deliver on your promises or you have to say why you're not delivering on them, even in the Chinese system. And I find it quite extraordinary that there isn't more emphasis on what exactly this, this government at the moment has delivered with, or, you know, delivered on in China. You know, people's lives, are they better now than they were four years ago? It's very questionable. It's very, very questionable. And that kind of thing will eventually have payback in China. Um, yes. Xi Jinping has been going on about corruption quite a lot. How sincere is he about corruption? How much does he really see it as a real problem for the Chinese state? And to what extent is it just a useful political tool? Yeah, I mean, uh, so it's been interpreted as part of a political struggle, but I think it, it may well be that. Uh, but it is true that in the fat years, in the Hu Jintao period, the party was maxing out all the time, and this was a huge political problem. And Wen Jiada and others at the time said this was unsustainable. So I think that there's sound structural and administrative and institutional reasons why you would have a purge like this. But most of the scholarship on it by people like Andrew Vaderman in America and others shows that, to be honest, to be a corrupt official in China is low risk. You know, only uh, the statistics show something like 80,000 officials have been caught amongst a group of 50, 60 million strong. So it's still very, very um, low risk. Uh, a farmer who was quoted in a very good book on this issue said something uh, which I think is indicative of the problem. Uh, he said, if an official isn't corrupt, we wonder what the hell is wrong with them. <laughs>
question? I'm oh, sorry, last question. No? Please. Um, um, I was just wondering how does a country with a sense of destiny work with an international structure dominated by self determined states? Um, in other words, can the destiny promised by Xi work within um, a world that doesn't respect fate? So I've learned to bring along one of your students is always a very, very high-risk strategy. <laughs> well, <coughs> so, 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 <laughs> um, the Chinese vision of destiny obviously is a contentious thing within, a, so the place where it most matters is Asia. I mean, do you think um, Americans or Europeans really think much about Chinese destiny beyond the Chinese economy having a bigger role and there being kind of political um, sort of playoffs that China gets through its investment, like in the UK and elsewhere. I mean, it's a very pragmatic, pragmatic thing, pragmatic thing. Uh, where you see the sort of, sort of pointy end of Chinese views of their own destiny, it's in the Asian region. And so at the Boyle Forum a couple of years ago in Hainan, they had this huge thing about common destiny for the Asian region. And I imagine if I was Japanese or Malaysian, I would get a little bit uncomfortable with that because it's part of the Xi Jinping politics is to say these great statements and they're very abstract and no one knows what the hell they mean. Uh, so the Belt Road Initiative is a very famous example. No one has a clue what it really is, but everyone uses it and thinks it says something. Uh, for Chinese destiny, I guess it's how people interpret the idea of a, an Asian region which is increasingly dominated by China and how palatable that is. I mean, that's really what it's about, isn't it? I mean, and I think that's the kind of fulcrum of Chinese foreign policy. I mean, I don't think it wants to particularly be globally dominant, uh, except economically have powers for its resources and stuff. It's very pragmatic. But in the region, I think it does want status. It's in the, it's, it, it wants a kind of controlling stake in the region. Um, and I suppose then that depends on the way in which America responds to that. Uh, we'll find out tomorrow. I mean, if it's Clinton, then it will probably be status quo. If it's Trump, we're going to be in business. Huh? I mean, China analysts are going to be very, very popular. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, it's very dependent on whether America wants to continue giving the kind of public goods it gives in the Asian region or, or scale back its security commitments there. I'm very conscious of the fact that Kerry's got to catch an aircraft to New York shortly. Could I have one last question? Thank you very much.